friends we will discuss about domain 2 domain 2 is about asset security so it covers the whole concept related to asset security i am taking a scenario here the scenario is you are a security manager of your organization and in your organization you want and your top management ask you to secure the company environment but when your top management ask you to secure, uh, secure the whole and company environment you you are thinking what exactly i need to secure it means you need to know what to secure then only you can secure it secure so asset security is about knowing what to secure how to secure and but doing classification all these things are covered in asset security so if i want to say in a single sentence what exactly asset security is so i can say that it is about the best policies practices and methods to properly assure the confidentiality integrity and availability of organization assets right so then the first thought that will come in my mind is what to asset uh, what to secure and if i am knowing what to secure then i can just start doing the rest of the security measures and i also need to check whether those inventory or asset list are regularly updated or not whether those are live or not live document means which is regularly up, up, uh, updated so in this we need to check for the same when you are thinking of the assets when you are saying a asset register asset inventory but you need to think what exactly a asset means asset covers two things one is okay uh, so asset covers two things one is tangible and intangible so tangible asset means which is physical which you can touch which you can feel so all those are tangible assets but intangible assets are virtual assets like a company account that is an asset the data you are having in your company that is a asset for you for your company and for you but that is a intangible assets so when you want to secure any particular asset then you are securing the whole uh, whole means the computing devices the it systems the software both installed as well as uh, you know, physical instance if you are having of those softwares the virtual com uh, computing platforms even if it is in the cloud and related hardware like the logs cabinets keyboards each and everything is covered in this with this a very important other part of the asset is the data asset which is more important these days because most of the companies are running on the data itself so we can say data is a subset of uh, valuable assets in any organization right so why we are talking about data assets we need to uh, we are talking about all those things only so normally data is stored in information systems uh, in, in databases in hardware some uh, sometimes it travel in the network also so we need to take care of all those parameters so let's discuss the concept of asset security is now you know what to secure you need to secure a asset and you know what exactly a asset means now you need to understand what exactly asset security means so asset security covers data protection particularly those that relate to data policy data governance quality documentation and organization so in asset security you need to do all these things you need to create a policy you need to do the governance you need to check for the quality you need to do the documentation and finally the organization of the asset as well as of the data right so we need to understand some of the terms so some of the terms we will take uh, we will take today are uh, before this uh, domain 1 is so domain 2 is asset asset protection and uh, data protection data policy data governance data quality data documentation data organization data cl classification and data categorization so once you understand all these then only you will get the complete picture of the overall uh, domain domain 2 asset security so let let's start with data policy data policy what information to collect how to keep it safe and how to secure or destroy the information when uh, the purpose of that particular information is already gone right so at the end from the very starting of the phase till the end of the phase data policy should cover everything it means how it will be collected how we will keep it safe and how we will uh, secure it and then how we, we will destroy it so data policy will cover the whole concept so data policy will need to be flexible and it should be able to accommodate the changes like when the gdpr came so there are lots of changes in the environment lots of changes in the control so lots of changes in the classification of the information that that kind some kind of information is previously classified something uh, else and now it is classified as something else so everything is 
taken care in the data policy. If the data policy is not flexible enough to accommodate those changes, then the whole data policy need to be changed, right? Then data policy should also play a significant role in data governance. Now, it means uh, we will see what exactly data governance is, but it is uh, data policy is the base of data governance. And a well-defined data policy provides direction for the management to set practices and standards which relate to quality, format, access and retention of the data. It means in data policy, these factors must be mentioned, but about the uh, set of the practices which we need to follow, the standards which uh, we need to follow, uh, standards for the quality, format, access and retention of the data. With this, we can move to data governance. So the data governance is something which tell the organization how to determine what to manage, how to create, but how it will transform and the uses of the data valued by the organization is covered under data governance. It means the concept of data governance include three things, people, process and IT uh, systems. So it will tell them how to handle data properly and consistently, both internally and externally. Suppose your company is uh, dealing with some external parties and uh, some vendors and your data is going to them. So your data governance should tell them that this is our data policy and you need to handle our data as per our data policy only. So data governance will establish responsibilities, one thing. It will help you to plan for the best support in the organization. It will also help you to acquire the validity for how much the uh, data will be valued. It, it will also ensure the performance as it when required from that particular data. It will also ensure the conformance with the rules and regulations of that particular law of land or globally. Also, data governance will help you to respect the for the human factors, right? Like the PII data, the PHI data, which is related to a particular human being. So it is the, the data governance who will tell us that these are the most important data which is related to the human factors. So we need to take care of the same separately. So data governance has the total goal of stopping any data misuse or any data related problem in your organization before they or begin before they begin so data governance is the as policy and data governance both of them is before that particular uh, any particular problem related to data happens right so all the policies and procedures they establish they reduce ambiguity and establish clear accountability and they also provide data related information to all stakeholders okay then comes data quality. When we are talking about data quality, then two things uh, which are very important related to data. One is integrity of the data and second reliability of the data. When we are saying integrity of the data, it means we are able to say that this is the actual data which is generated from the source itself and there is no change in the same. Right? It is important to verify and validate data throughout the useful life cycle. Uh, with that only we can say uh, we can improve the we can have the same integrity throughout the life cycle of the data. So factors such as accuracy, uh, uh, currency and relevance are the top list of items to check for when measuring the data quality. Okay. And when we are talking about data quality, two important factors uh, are coming. One is quality assurance and second is quality control. When we are saying quality assurance, which it prescribes the standard to the SSR and to discover inconsistencies and other anomalies in the data. Right? And quality control is checking uh, uh, the quality of the data as per the internal standards. Okay, That can be done by some process and procedures. There are two kinds of error which we need to take care while we are talking about the data quality. One is the error of commission and other one is the error of omission. When we are saying error of commission, error of commission is or having some inaccurate data or having some mistakes in the data. All of this is covered in error of commission but in error of omission there is some missing data which we cannot say that where exactly the data is so it is very difficult to pinpoint the error of omissions but the, uh, the error of commission can be easily taken care of right so in respect of cissp we need to understand these concepts further is data documentation so as to manage anything properly we need to document the same same thing is with the data so whenever we want to data uh, we want to document the data, we are able to document the data, we can manage that, that particular data easily. Because we need to tell how long, uh, how old the data is, how many times it was reused, how the data, what exactly the content of the data is, 
what exactly the context of the data is, what is the time limit for what the data need to be stored. And we can also easily discover that particular data. And if we want to change uh, or uh, move the data from one system to the other system, then it is very easy for us if it is well documented. We can use some of the concepts which are related to data in data documentation. These concepts are metadata. Metadata is data of the data is metadata. Then readme file. Information of the data in a small separate file is readme file. And we can use the file content to do the data documentation. Okay. Next concept is the data organization. So in this domain, we require all these concepts. That's why I'm discussing all these concepts with you. Next is the data organization. The data organization is the process to arrange and control the, the data. So uh, when we are saying arrange and control data means categorizing structure and schema of the data. So all these things are the small component of data organization. So the purpose of this component is to make the data more useful, right? So if it is well organized, it is well structured, then we can say it is more useful. Like some of the system, they will accept only structured data only, but most of the devices like the logs, uh, the feeds from some of the uh, social platforms is in an unstructured form. So we need to bring them in a structured form so that we can use in some of the systems. So that's why data organization came into picture. So we can say structured data is acquired, maintained and analyzed within the context of a formal data model. But unstructured data is not at all in in a well acquired way, in a well maintained way or well analyzed way. So we need to uh, do the data structuring of a unstructured data. Like I am taking an example here, like a relational database that, uh, that is a structured data, but a data feed from a social platform that is an unstructured data. Then comes the data classification. So if you are talking about data class classification, data collected, stored and used in an organization need to be classified or organized into tiers or classes based on the level of sensitivity the organization uh, created. So there's no standard for having a standard classification for everywhere. Like there's no way that we can say that this is tier 1, this is tier 2, tier 3 and we can implement the same in every organization. No. Every organization, organization need to have their own data classification. Okay. So using that particular data classification, they can check, okay, they can create their own classification and then further as per that classification, they can categorize that data or information. Okay, so class, uh, categorization has two principal uh, function. One is it assign or reflect the value of the asset and second, it, about, uh, it gives the risk tolerance value that this is the level of the risk till which we can manage that particular data. Except this, we will not manage anything. So our objective from this domain is to understand, to understand how to identify, classify information and asset. It can be done via two ways, data classification and asset classification. Then uh, the second part for, of this particular domain is we need to determine and maintain information and asset ownership. Also, we need to see what exactly how to protect the privacy of the data. So for that, we need to understand the roles and responsibilities of data owners. We need to check. Uh, the roles and responsibility of data processors. We need to check the concept of, of data reminiscence and we need to know how to collect and how to limit the collection of the data. Okay. And the uh, next topic is we need to understand is ensure appropriate asset retention. We need to check if you, we are going to retain any particular asset. So how to appropriately we can do the same. Then we need to determine the data security standards, which can uh, data security controls, which, which are using the concept of scoping tailoring and we need to do some standard selections and data protection methods we will see in the last. So and the very last topic is we need to uh, check for the established information and asset handling requirements. Okay. Okay. Let's start the domain to now. Asset classification. So it means the top level they classify, they categorize that in my organization or in our organization, we will have these three or four categories of assets. Right? This is the most important assets for my organization. This is the least important asset for my organization. This is the asset which need to be categorized at this level. So that is done at the top management level. There is no standard for the same. There is no fit for all rule. Right? So it means every organization need to categorize the assets as per their own internal levels. Okay? And then they will give their own nomenclature. Right? 
So once they will classify, they will categorize that particular, then they need to do the grouping. Like I'm taking one example here. This is a web server. Web server is the most important one because if the web server goes down, then it will impact the overall working of the whole organization because we are, it is a uh, online platform company. So that's why I will classify a web server or the application ser server and the database server as the, at the tier one, but all the development system, I can classify, uh, classify them at, at the tier two. So that is my categorization. Now, maybe my organization is running three application altogether. So all the web server will come in the category one, tier one. So that's why I will call it as grouping. I need to do grouping because whenever I need to put any security control, I will put all those security control over the whole group, similar security control. Like for the web server, if I have defined a baseline for the tier one, that whatever server will come in my tier one, I need to give a proper baseline. I need to put them, uh, it means I need to give a proper baseline on them. Then only I will put them in the production phase, right? So all the tier one system will follow a proper baseline. Then only they will enter into the production phase. That's how the grouping will impact this. So the type of the assets which uh, normally in any organization are databases, email, storage, endpoint, computer systems, telephones, network. So all these are the data uh, assets and data is also one of the type of the assets. Moving further, let's see how we classify the assets. So there are some particular steps. There are in total five steps for asset classification. These are first, we need to define the classification levels. As we already discussed the top management, they need to do this step. They will classify that in our organization, the level of these are the three level, four level, whatever they will decide, they will decide it. Then there will be a proper inventory of the assets. We need to have a report of each and every asset, whether it is tangible asset, whether it is intangible asset. We will have a record of each and every asset in our asset register or inventory software. Then the third step is we will pinpoint the resp responsible owner or person who is responsible for that particular asset, whether even if it is a data or even if it is a storage server, then we need to pinpoint that this is the owner of this particular asset, right? And the third, fourth step is the asset value analysis. Without value, we cannot say that this is the most critical one, right? So if we are giving, we are assigning some value to that particular asset, then only we can say that this is the most important one. So third is the asset value. So in this, we can assign two kinds of value. One is a qualitative, other one is a quantitative value. And the last step is assigning classification level. So whatever level is decided by the top management, as per the value of that particular asset, we will classify those assets. Right. So these are the five steps by which we classify the uh, assets in our environment. Right. So I'm taking the next slide. The next slide discuss about what are the benefits while we are discussing about the asset classification, but what are the actual benefits we are getting from the asset classification? So because of the asset classification, it is very, if we are having very accurate inventory, so it is very easy for us if we are going to implement some change then we say that we are having these many of uh, servers of this particular kind. So it is very easy for us to do the change management. Then comes the vulnerability assessment and management. So if we are having an accurate inventory, then it is very easy for us to do the vulnerability management. And in the last comes the patch management. So if we are having a proper list of the all the inventory, then we can do the patch management in a very quick and fast and proper way. It also improve asset classification also improve implementation of the security control and segmentation. If in my environment, I am going to implement a virtual zones, a virtual segments, then, and if I'm having a well classified inventory of asset, then I can easily create those segmentations. And if I need to tailor some protection of sensitive data, suppose uh, there's a new guideline, as per new guideline, I need to give, or we need to give proper protection to all PIIs. So if I'm having well classified uh, assets, then I can pinpoint that these are the 10 servers which are holding the PIIs and I can easily implement those security controls on those. And then if anyone add a new asset in my environment, anyone bring a new Wi-Fi, new laptop, new, uh, I can say a mobile phone or uh, any other device in my environment, then easily I can pinpoint the same because I'm having an accurate inventory of my whole organization. And in the last is we can 
easily understand any potential risk, new risk. Like uh, there's a new advisory from uh, uh, organization, whether it is a CERT or some other organization, if there's a new advisory that all these devices with this, this version number are impacted by a new vulnerability, there's a new exploit of the same. Then if I'm having an accurate inventory, accurate classification, then I, I can easily plug that particular uh, risk and, or I can take any mitigation step on that particular risk. So these are the benefits. Moving further, when we are doing the asset classification, as I already told you, there's no standard, there's no actual standard to do asset classification. There's no mandatory formula, there's no nomenclature. So, but each organization, they need to define their own nomenclature, they need to define their own names, their own sensitivity levels. So asset classification will give a framework to illustrate how a portfolio or asset in an organization can be segmented into a critical that map to high, medium and low. It means we will see one example on this to understand this in a better way. So this is the example. Suppose any organization has created a classification level. In this particular classification level, they have created four tires. It means four levels, different levels, tier 0, tier 1, tier 2 and significant system. So when I'm saying tier 0, they put anything and everything that is having a direct business impact if it goes down. They put it in tier 0, like the domain, uh, domain controllers, the databases, the email servers, the file servers and the web servers, firewalls, routers, everything. Because if any one of these goes down, then it is impacting the whole business, whole operations. Then comes the tier one. Tier one normally covers anything which is having the actual data, right? The critical data, the backup systems, the department file shares, network devices. It means it is essential to a specific department, but not to the entire business. It means if it, it goes down, it will impact the operation of a particular department, not of the whole organization. Okay, so we will classify that in tier one. Then is tier 2. Tier 2 is any desktop, laptop, mobile, printer, desk phone, pen drive. So anything which is used by an individual, not by a department. And if it goes down if, or if it is not in use or if it cannot be used, then it will impact the operation of a particular person. And it will not impact the whole uh, company. So that is, we will put all those uh, assets in tier 2. And in the last comes the significant system. So significant system will deal with any stored data like uh, CHD, cardholder data, PHIs or any financial data. So any system which is storing these kind of information is classified as a significant system because if these systems are hacked or if they are compromised then in that particular case they are having an impact on the not the working of the system or uh, not the working of the organization they will have a, some regulatory or some financial impact on the organization. That's why we classify them as a significant systems. Okay, so this is this is just an example. Maybe your organization is using some other uh, classification levels, but this is just one example. Okay, moving to the next slide. Next slide. In next slide, we are discussing about uh, the data classification. So first, we need to understand what is the purpose. The purpose of data classification is to say that. At this particular data classification level, I will use these menu of control, right? So when I'm classifying that particular data, I'm classifying them as per the sensitivity and as per the criticality. Sensitivity normally covers the value of the data to the organization. And if it is compromised, what is the loss of the, the same to the organization? Any legislative driver, it means that uh, there are some rules, regulations are there. Or if there is any liability, if I lose the PHI data publicly, then there are some liabilities, financial liability, which I need to uh, check with, right? And then the value to the competitors. If my competitors are able to get that particular data, then they are having a over, uh, they, they are having an edge over me. So that's how, because it is a competitive environment. So if my competitors are get to know that these are the tenders I'm going to deal in, or these are the uh, customers I'm dealing with. So if they are able to get this particular information, then they are having an edge over my business. So that's why it is very sensitive for my business. Then acquisition cost, like the IPR. If my company has purchased an IPR, intellectual property right from somewhere, and they have paid a heavy cost for the same, that comes under acquisition cost, right? So all these are the factor for sensitivity. Next is criticality. Criticality is the time. Time means if 
like the result, the CBSE result or any organization result is coming on so and so date. And if it is released before that particular date, so that is having a negative impact on that particular organization. Or like any country is having a war plan. So and if that particular is compromised, then in that particular case, that is impacting the criticality of the whole operation. So criticality is mainly with the financial, with the top secret. So with these two parameters, we can say that this data is classified with this particular sensitivity and this particular criticality level. And we can classify this using labels. So as yesterday we discussed about the subject and object. So we need to give a label to all objects. So marking uh, sensitivity of the object is labeling, we can say. So when we are doing the classification, we are labeling the uh, objects. And then we need to give a clearance. Clearance we will normally give to the subjects. That this is the clearance level which we need to give to this particular subject. Okay. So clearance is trustworthiness of a subject. We can say that this, I can assume that this is a trustworthy subject. So I'm giving full clearance, full access to this particular file. So when I'm saying this, then I'm giving rights, rights to that particular subject. And I'm giving permission of that particular file. And a combination of these two, right and permission, is we call it as a privilege. And in any security model, we create compartments. Compartment is what? Compartment is creating controls of high sensitivity and uh, which will uh, clear the clearance and need to know. When we combine these principles all together, then we create compartments. So we can say to secure any data or asset, we need to value, give a value to that particular asset. Then we need to classify that particular asset. And finally, we need to implement control to secure that particular asset. So marking is a technique by which we uh, secure sensitive data to be marked to prevent so that they will not be mishandled. Okay. Moving further is classification model. Okay. In the exam point of view, it is very important to understand two classification models. One is a government and military model and second is a corporate model. So, but both these models are depend on a single framework and that is a exposure or consequence framework. Exposure or consequence. In case of any exposure of that particular data, what exactly the consequence the organization can face, whether it will face a grave damage, serious damage, damage or no damage. Okay, so both these models are dependent on this particular framework. So I can say on class zero, there's no damage. Means if it is appropriate, then we classify it as a public data. And if it is a government, we classify it as an unclassified data. And if that particular data is in a public domain, it is available to everyone, then we can say there is no damage at all. So we classify at class zero. Then if it is class one, then it is having some of the damage on a particular project, on a particular department, right? Then we will classify it as a confidential in government case and sensitive in corporate case. And next level is the serious damage. It will uh, create a serious, uh, serious damage. If that particular data is exposed to the outside world or outside people, then it will create a serious damage to the reputation of the company, right? So it is in government, we call it as a secret data and in a corporate world, we call it as a private data. Next is the grave damage or class three level. So class three is top secret in government or military model. And in corporate model, we call it as confidential and proprietary model. So if this particular data is compromised. So the whole entity identity, that means the whole entity can face a grave damage. Even they need to close down the whole operations, right? So these are the classification model of the data, which we need to understand. In the exam, you will get some of the indirect questions over this classification model that uh, there is a grave damage to the expose. Uh, if any particular uh, document is uh, released to the outside world, and it caused a grave damage, what level of uh, classification model it is having in corporate model. So you can say it is confidential or it is a proprietary uh, document, right? So if you understand this, you need to understand the second part, that is the management life cycle, asset management life cycle. So if you are seeing the asset as everything is having a life cycle, so in the same way, asset is also having a life cycle. And here we are discussing about the asset management life cycle. So how the asset is managed in different phases of its life cycle. So there are the five phases in all. 
these five phases are plan acquire deploy manage and dispose in plan suppose i want to bring a new device a new software in my environment so i need to plan for the same i need to check these are the parameters which need to be there these are the requirement which it should fill okay this is the budget i i need to uh, i can give for this particular asset so all these things comes into into the planning phase then i will release a tender okay i will release a tender if acquire and development comes in the same phase if i am able to competent enough to develop the whole software in my organization internally then i will instead of acquire i will do development but if i am not able to uh, do that internally then i need to purchase it from outside so i will call it as acquire phase in acquire phase i will do the whole tendering process and i will decide that this is the vendor who is going to supply this particular product to my environment right then once that particular product is inside my environment then i need to deploy the same in the deployment phase the actual implementation i will test whatever i have decided in my planning that these are the 10 requirements which i need from this particular product so in the deployment phase i will measure okay i am it is uh, verifying one on one and i am it is uh, whatever requirements i uh, i have done i have proposed in my planning phase in the deployment phase it is uh, it means it is completing all of them then i i will say i will give a sign off to my vendor yes i accept that this, that particular product and then it come to the owner operation and maintenance phase and that is we call it as a manage phase so whatever may be after uh, deployment also sometimes we require further support from the vendor so that is also covered in the manage phase sometimes we require extra tuning of the product that is also covered in the manage phase and there is a life cycle of the product so maybe after 5 year 10 years that particular product is of no use some other new product is there in the available in the market so we i will i need to dispose the same and while disposing i need to take care what kind of data it, it, it is storing what kind of information it is having what kind of process it is using so according to that particular classification level i will dispose it or i will just disintegrate it completely right so this is the complete asset management life cycle which we need to understand before moving in into this domain two so, so in this life cycle some more uh, stages are there which we need to understand we need to formally assign the ownership of the asset to someone when it comes into our environment normally the person who raised the requirement of that particular product he is the owner but it may be different in some cases it may be different but normally we give the ownership to that particular product uh, person itself then come information technology asset management so itam itam is if there is any asset in our organization for information technology purpose we need to do a proper management of the same so we will use sam or other uh, techniques we will just discuss on those later on then comes the change management so if there is any change there is any configuration management so all these are also part of the asset management life cycle these are not the major part but these are the minor part but we need to understand the same what exactly change management means what exactly configuration management means what exactly ownership means so all these are also required in this particular domain okay as i discussed about the, uh, in the last topic that uh, idm so similar, we have sam software asset management sam will do a continuous monitoring it will check okay these are the 10 assets in our environment asset means here it assets i am talking about it will keep on checking them whichever is up whichever is not there which is uh, live for this many of time duration which is not live for this many much of time duration what is the version of the software they they are having what is the version of firmware they are having so it will do a complete monitoring of everything whatever ip they are having so whatever uh, what is the version of software they are having and according to those version it will take a feed from the oem and it will compare from the oem feed it will check okay these particular products are having these much of vulnerabilities and these vulnerabilities is having risk level of this much kind and then it will give a prioritization list to us to the manager who is managing that particular software it will give a list to them that these are the most prioritized software which you need to update as fast as possible once he will give a go ahead to that or he will approve the same in the software then automatically the patching process will be done so this is all about the software asset management sam so sam must include inventory of the application which is must Then, uh, then it is it it must have the current list of the known vulnerabilities which will it will get from the feed from the parents. 
uh, OEM. Then prioritization of the each vulnerability by risk level. Then each application patch level it, it, it must know. Then action to patch or apply alternative or compensatory control. So all these things are covered in, in the SEM. So next comes the software licensing. So in, while we are doing uh, say, uh, talking about the inventory, in the inventory we need to invent, uh, do the inventory of the software also. But in software we need to understand the software licensing. We need to understand what exactly different kind of licenses are in the market. And what are the licenses we are having in a type of the licenses we are having in our environment. So like EULA, site license, subscription software license, perpetual license, consumptive license. So these are the five different licensing we are having. And whatever software we are using, those lie in one of those environments. Like site license, I'm saying, are talking about. In site license, we will purchase a license for a particular site. Site may be a particular region, a particular location, a particular country. So for that particular uh, site, if I purchase 10 license, so within that particular region, I can use 10 license, right? Subscription li uh, software license, as we are using most of the software these days, they are using subscription license, like license for one month, license for one year, for this many number of people is subscription license. After my subscription is over, either it will renew itself or it will auto close, depending on the setting which I have selected in my application. Then comes the perpetual license. In case of perpetual license, I will get a particular paper license or I can say I, I will get some license. If I use one license, that will be removed from my total list of license. Then comes the consumptive license. I will say I will purchase a license for the whole thing, but whether it is 10, 1500. Moving further is PII, PHI and record retention. These are the terms which we need to understand to understand the whole topic in a better way, the whole domain in a better way. PII is uh, information that can identify or trace an individual. Uh, it can be a name, social security number, place of birth, date of birth, biometric records. Like, uh, okay, so PIIAs are normally stored in any particular system. So those systems need to be taken extra care because it is a mandatory practice as per GDPR as, as well as the other regulatory authorities also to uh, give extra care to those systems who are storing the PIIAs. Then comes the PHIs. PHI means the personal health records, which is specified by HIPAA and it covers all information which is taken by the healthcare provider, it means the hospitals or doctors, health plans, public health authority, life insurers, healthcare clearing house, employer, university or school. So all of them, they take some health information. So that is covered under PHI. And all the record retention, time to retain audit logs or data as is specified by the organization policy or regulatory requirement is record retention. It means uh, like FINRA, FINRA is, uh, suppose FINRA, in FINRA we got some regulation that we need to have the financial record for at least one year. So that is a record retention time frame. We call it as a record retention. We need to have the record with us for that particular time frame. That's what record retention means. So once we have the idea of these uh, terms, then we need to know the states in which the data can be. Then there are three different states of data and these three different states of data is data in use, data in transit, data at rest. So data in use, whenever I'm working on any Excel sheet, PDF, Word, whatever it is. So whenever directly I'm working on any particular application, then I'm in the state of data in use. So the data is in the state of data in use. And when I'm accessing a database, I'm operating a corporate application or I'm even I'm using a cloud app or a mobile app. then the data which currently is there in that particular application or system, that is a data in use. And data in transit is when I'm transmitting something, like if I'm sending a mail to you with an attachment, that is data in transit. Other forms of data in transit are when we do some upload, a land transfer, VPN, instant messaging, peer-to-peer, -peer, cloud sync app, Wi-Fi, mobile network, all those are covered in data in transit. And the last comes data at rest. So whenever we store the data, all the storage is data at rest. So maximum security required is at data at rest and data in transit. Okay, right. So we will, once we have the understanding of this, then uh, we can see some 
overview of this like data at rest means data residing in pc backup tapes drive and send storage and to protect the same we can use a encryption a script encryption such as aes256 and data in use data in use means data being used by a data processor so write management dlp protects data in use then comes data in motion and transit so data transmitted over wired or wireless network or internet is data in uh, motion or transit so encryption we can use encryption to protect data in such a phase like uh, tls ipsec these are the two kind of encryption we can use for the same next comes problem of uh, data reminiscence data remin reminiscence means whenever we are uh, having data anywhere like in any hard drive in any pen drive or anywhere then whenever we delete that particular data then that is not actually deleted from the hard drive or pen drive because we are having two different sections of uh, uh, in the hard drive or in the pen drive one is the index table and other one is the actual space where we store that particular data so whenever we are deleting something from the hard drive then we are normally deleting the entry of the same from the index file so index file will have a entry of the file that this particular file is starting from this location and ending at this particular location right so whenever i am deleting that particular data i am deleting the entry of the same from the index but i am not actually deleting or removing the data from the actual drive okay so whenever and this problem this phenomena is known as data reminiscence and even if i erase that particular data from that particular drive the storage space also then also because of the concept of bad sector okay the concept of bad sector is in any drive the data is composed of small small cells bits so when we combine those cells together then we are having byte and then we are having a bigger sector so if even a single or a particular number of cells are bad in any particular sector then we pinpoint or we tell that particular sector that it is a bad sector okay we uh, label that uh, sector as a bad sector so whenever the operating system is writing any data then it will not write the data over the bad sectors but in that particular bad sector itself there these are the only few cells maybe 5 or 10 cells which are bad rest of the 100 200 or 1000 of cells these are good cells so whenever if i want to recover that particular data from the bad sector i can I, i can recover the data very well okay so but that is not a full data but even if, if it is a part of the data it it will give you me some of the information that whatever the information is stored in this particular system so all these are we call as data reminiscence problem it means the data left after erasing is data reminiscence reminiscence so there are some techniques to take care of the same these are erasing coloring decoding purging declassifying san, uh, sanitization and destruction okay we use these at different scenarios but what are those scenarios understand the same uh, you need to understand the same these scenarios are if you want to reuse that particular data again then you need you to reuse some of the techniques like if you want to you have stored some top secret information in one hard drive and i want to use the hard drive again to store my top secret information now as we are using the same level here the level of the data is top secret in your case also in my case also then if when you are giving that particular hard drive to me you can either erase it you can either clear it or you can either decode it right but i want to suggest you not to decode the same the reason for the same is once you decode it it is useless okay we will discuss what exactly decode is so erase uh, we will discuss first what exactly these terms are so erasing erasing means uh, deleting operation it will delete only the entry from the file table it will not delete the actual data the second is clearing so if my department is different or if i am i am a separate different person so i will do uh, first you will clear it then you will give it uh, give it to me clearing means overwriting that the data you will write over the whole hard, hard drive you will write some more data more data and then either you will write uh, you will use a third party software and you will write all once in the whole hard drive that is clearing decoding is to create a strong magnetic field as it is a magnetic drive then if you create a strong magnetic field of more than one tesla then you can completely 
degrades the whole heart drive. You can destroy the whole pattern in which the magnetic field, because in a magnetic heart, heart drive, the information is stored in the form of bits. It is in the form of a magnetic domain, which is having angle. So we will just measure that particular angle and then we will say, okay, it is zero, it is one, it is zero, it is one. That's why when we degrade it, we will just remove all those magnetic domains from their particular location, right? So when each particular magnitude domains is removed, removed then we will say that we, we have done the degaussian process. So whenever we want to reuse that particular data in the same level, either I will use erasing, I will do coloring, or I will do a degaussian. And the next is using the data in a lower level. Suppose you are using it as at a top secret level and I want to use the same at the secret level. So before giving it to me, you will either purge it, declassify it or sanitize it. Now, but what purging means, what declassifying means and what sanitization means. Purging means clearing multiple times. It means writing 0, 1, 0, 1 multiple times, 32 times, 50 times. Okay, that's what purging means. So as the number of the purging increase, as the number of the clearing cycle increase, then the chances of retrieval of the data is decreasing. Okay, then comes the declassifying of data. While we are declassifying the data, declassifying means that it is top secret now and now I want to put it into the secret category. The controls for classification or the, uh, the controls for top secret is that I need to store the data in an encrypted form. But when I am storing the data in uh, secret, then I can store the same in a normal form. So I need to remove all the encryption software from, the, from that particular hard drive. And once I remove that particular encryption software, then there is no way that whatever data, if anyone they are able to retrieve, then they are not able to decrypt the same, right? But with this, I need to do the sanitization also. Sanitization is just checking, verifying whatever I have done, whether I have clear, whether I have done the purging, whether, whether it is okay or not. That's what sanitization is. It means verifying that I have purged it then I need to check whether still the data is there or not there. That's what sanitization is. But nowadays the software or the, sorry, the hardware cost is going very low. That's why we can easily, instead of doing the declassifying and sanitization, we can purchase a new. But in certain cases, suppose the hard drive goes bad. So you need to give the same to the outside vendor. In that particular case, it is recommended. Either if it is storing a top secret data, you need to destruct it. Or the second case is you can uh, just degauss it. Okay. So you can get some questions uh, on this. Like uh, for this particular uh, same level, if you want to use, what you will use, whether you will erase, you, you will clear, or you will degauss it. Like that you will get. So to answer those questions, you can use this particular slide. In this particular slide, I have given a complete picture in which uh, I have taken six scenarios. Scenarios of a hard drive, backup tape, SSD, CD, DVD, uh, writable, uh, single time read or rewritable, or a flash drive. So in every scenario, if you are going to use, we use the same at the same level. So you can, what you can do. In case of hard drive, you can just clear it. In case of a backup tape, you can just clear it. Okay. In case of SSD, you can use the OEM commands. In case of flash drive, you can use the clearing. In case of a read write uh, CD or DVD, you can just clear it. But in case of a CD or DVD drive, there is no way of doing the same. So you need to disrupt the same. Like this, if you go through each one of them, then it is very easy for you to understand the whole concept of devices and reminiscence. And definitely you will get a question on this in the exam. Okay, moving further is Asset security roles. So when we classify any particular information or we classify the assets in our organization, when, then we need to make someone responsible for the same. And this responsibility starts with giving some roles to someone. And the first role is of the information security officer. Now the information security officer, it is the task of the information security officer to communicate the risk to the higher management of the asset classification and of uh, different uh, 
phase the how the uh, data is moving through the network and what are the controls they are doing so the communication of the risk to the upper management is the role of the information security officer also he is the person who need to give best practices to influence the policies standard procedure and guidelines related to asset management with this he also need to establish strong security measures so that the data can be protected and the asset can be protected in either of the three stages then he need to comply with the government and industry regulation also he need to be aware with the emerging threats so that he he can uh, change the best practices or the policies of the data with this there are some data roles associated to the other members also like the data owner asset and system owner mission and business owner so ultimately the data owner is the typical ceo president department head or the project head we can say then ultimate whole responsibility lies with him only so he is the person who establishes the rules for the appropriate use and protection of the data and system owner will just assist in the identification selection and assessment of the security controls he will not uh, it means he is the system manager we can say so he will just store the data of the system owner he will develop and maintain system security plan to ensure system is secure and operate according to the security requirement then comes the mission or business owner he is the person who provide the system uh, he it means who will provide the value of the system to the organization like uh, he owns the process that use the system like the sales team we can say using uh, sap so sales team is a mission or business owner and as the sales team is giving value sap sap is of no value to the organization if the sales team is not using it so that's why the person or the team who is giving a business value to that particular asset is the part of mission or business owner they are responsible to ensure that the security controls are mis not misguided or impacting the business if we uh, put too many controls on sap servers then the sales team is not able to use the same in the ground then they will tell us uh, they tell the security team okay we need to lower down the security control because we are not able to access the application in the ground right so some more data roles are there like the data custodian data processor data controller data administrator and data user data custodian is the person who will do who will manage the data on day to day basis right so he uh, example data owner state that the data has to be backed up daily if the data owner is saying that the data need to be backed up daily then the data custodian will take this particular data backup operation and data processor can be a individual a system or organization that process data on behalf of the data controller now what is a data controller data controller is to control the use of the data okay so that is the it is a requirement of the gdpr and other regulatory authorities to have a data controller in every environment who will tell how to use that particular data right then comes the administrator administrator is responsible to grant appropriate access to personal based on least privilege or need to know with a role based access model so administrator will give access the rights that this is the person who will have this much of access this is the person who can have this much of access as per the uh, guide, guidelines from the data owner and user the ultimate person who is going to use that particular data who is going to access that particular data for work right like the pay, uh, payroll account user who access data employee data for payroll management so the payroll accountant is a user here so if you understand this concept then we can move to the data protection control okay so while the data is in storage how we can control uh, how we can protect the same using some controls now those controls will have some kind of techniques or some kind of technology associated to them and these technology are encryption so while it is stored we can use three different kind of encryption normally in storage we use symmetric encryption symmetric encryption is where we use a single key only for encryption and decryption both so uh, we can use aes 3ds and blowfish this is as per the cissp syllabus only i am talking about so in aes we can use 128 bit of encryption 192 bit of encryption and 256 bits of encryption and 3d yes we can use 56 112 and 168 bit of encryption and in blowfish we can use 32 or 448 bits of encryption and while the data is in transit or in motion then we can use asymmetric encryption in asymmetric encryption there are two 
keys. One is a public key and other one is a private key. In a public key, uh, we can say the data is encrypted using the public key and then it will be decrypted using the private key only. And two examples of or the two techniques of using uh, asymmetric encryption in data protection when it is in transition is SSL, OTLS and IPsec, right? Okay, moving to the next topic, some more security controls we can take like pseudonymization and anonymization. In pseudonymization, what I will do, I will just replace that data with some random data, okay? But I'm maintaining a data of uh, a table of the same separately and whenever required, I can just pinpoint to the same. It means it is reversible. I can reverse it to that particular thing. Anonymization is irreversible. So I will just replace that particular data with a, some random data. Suppose your DLP in your network uh, catch a particular traffic, which is having a credit card shared in an email ID. So when that particular credit card number, you will get an alert of the same, but you will find that particular credit card number is masked. You cannot retrieve that particular credit card number ever. So that's what anonymization is. So uh, taking one more example here, uh, like here, my name is Abhay, but in the table, my name is replaced by Alpha. So no one is going, if anyone is going to see this particular table, they are not able to pinpoint who exactly Alpha is, right? So uh, pseudonymization is irreversible, okay? Uh, okay. Tokenization is reversible, pseudonymization is reversible, but anonymization is irreversible. And this is the example of a pseudonymization table. And credit card, uh, passing credit card number passing through the uh, DLP when masked is the example of anonymization. Okay, next is the security controls. So in this domain, in domain two, you need to understand the security controls for the asset security. But while we are implementing the security controls, you need to do a baselining of the same. You need to do the scoping of the same, or you need to do a tailoring of the same. And from where exactly you do this baselining, tailoring, scoping from the standards, from the industry standards or from the international standards, like uh, PCI DSS, GLBA, SOX, EPA, all these are the standards from which you will take the baselines. So you can create the baseline from the uh, list special publication 853, which is uh, which is the list of the all the standards. So you you can take the uh, baselines from there. So baseline ensure a minimum security standard and a starting point for the security controls. Then comes the examples. In examples, uh, for this example, you can take uh, like uh, telnet HTTP. You need to disable whenever you need to move that particular system in production. You need to disable the same. That's what. Uh, this baselining is scoping. Scoping is reviewing baseline and selecting relevant control to the system or organization. Suppose any particular standard which you have taken, it is giving hundreds of controls to you. But out of those hundred controls, you will you are seeing that these are the only 70 controls which are relevant to my system or organization. What you have done? You have done scoping, right? And next is tailoring. Tailoring is the baseline to fit the organization requirement. Now you have a specific requirement that in your organization itself, you are using a particular, I can say, encryption method. But in the baselining or the standard which you are using, they are saying use the uh, encryption standard this. But as in your uh, this uh, the organization, you are using a separate encryption standard. So in your baseline, you will change the same. You will change the requirement. So that's what tailoring means. So with this friend, I want to say this is the complete domain two, that is asset security. And with this much of knowledge, I can say you can have a better understanding of the overall domain. But it is very important to go through the topic by topic videos, which is given in my channel. You can watch each and every video, but the framework of the whole domain two is this, what we have discussed just now. So uh, with this, I want to say one more thing that uh, before you study this particular domain and close this particular uh, domain, you need to revise the basic concept. And I have put all the basic concept related to asset security in the Quizlet in the topic 1363. So here you are total 26 
terms I have given. These 23 terms cover everything, whatever we have discussed uh, in the initial two slides of this particular uh, video, like the asset, data policy, data governance, guiding principles for data governance, data quality, quality assurance, quality control. So every 26 terms are given here. So it is my recommendation to just go through this asset security concept once before and after starting this particular domain. Okay. Thank you, friends. Thank you for watching. Thank you.